Barclays is a global wealth manager with total client assets of £164 billion pounds as at uh, December 2011. Offices in over 20 countries. Wealth and investment management focuses on private and intermediary clients worldwide by providing international and private banking as well as investment management amongst others. Now to talk on the Eurozone fears and the gold prices and the outlook for the US, we're joined by Hank Potts who is equity strategist at Barclays Wealth. Hank, good evening. Now the so US sovereign debt crisis that we have... We talk about it every day. We talk about the Eurozone crisis. We talk about what's going to happen to Greece. This is a crisis which is staying a crisis. Most crises resolve themselves one way or another. This crisis is like now routine. Well, the bad news is not only can it not be solved overnight, not as only will it be unlikely to be solved during the course of this year, we believe it may take up to a decade before we get to the level where we see European countries that are fiscally integrated, that are returning back to a competitive nature. That's the bad news. The good news, I suppose, is that actually day by day, authorities are working incredibly hard to put solutions in place to try and ease those crises. I think you can point to the work done by the European Central Bank as an important game changer. Those long-term refinancing operations, I think, have been important. It's absolutely vital that indebted countries continue to introduce austerity measures in a transparent and tangible fashion, as we've seen in the past few trading sessions. The market's become a little bit concerned from the likes of Greece that they won't be able to continue down that path. So I think that is very important indeed. But beyond that, we need to hear an awful lot more about the road to fiscal union, how to generate job opportunities, how to generate growth. That has got to be part of the solution as well. Until we get clarity on that, the markets will still remain nervous. Of course, the other things are happening at the same time. It's not just Europe. So increasingly, uh, United States, increasing confidence, better numbers, not a huge recovery, but a slow, steady one. Increasingly, people are saying, well, that's the way Europe should have gone. Mm -hmm. And then you've got uh, Greece and the, the idea that uh, as, if Greece does go out of the Eurozone, and there are people who are saying that it will, then it, it means it's possible. It's possible for a country to leave the Eurozone. And then if Greece then has certain effects which other countries would like to achieve, well, then we have a domino effect. Well, you point to the risk quite clearly there, and that's why the French, the Germans, are prepared to write some pretty big checks to make sure that doesn't happen. It's hard to see who would benefit if we started to see the Eurozone fragment. I don't think it would be in the benefit of Greece, for example, for them to leave the Eurozone. Uh, I think we'd see a run on their banks, we'd see private savings absolutely decimated. They'd be importing a huge amount of inflation. These are people that need a huge amount of energy. For what benefit? To make their companies competitive, you're pretty hard-pressed to come up with a list of Greek companies that are out there that would certainly benefit from a more competitive currency. And on Germany's side, you point to the fact that they need strong partners out there to buy their products, and they certainly don't need their currency to go through the roof. And that is why we still believe that authorities will work as hard as they can to write checks as big as they can to make sure the European project continues to work. Is it ideal? Absolutely not. But they'll continue to muddle through. Hink, uh, the one thing we didn't consider was a change in government. And now it appears that every election that we have in Europe, we're seeing new government coming who are creating a new dynamic for trying to solve the issue in, uh, in Europe. You know, how, how do you see this uh, unfolding where we now have a change of government in, in France, we've got problems in Greece, we, not, not every new leader is a Mario Monti. That's correct. So far, actually, the changes that we've seen mm. in the Eurozone before we had these recent elections in France and in Greece has actually been positive, because what we've been seeing is many of the politicians have been kicked out and they've been replaced by the technocrats. The reason why that's important, of course, is because good long-term economic sense doesn't always marry with short-term political sense. Politicians focus on what's going to keep them in a job rather than what's good for the economy. The technocrats have done a good job. However, when you start to look at France, when you start specifically to look at Greece, the situation changes quite dramatically. And the uncertainty that's been created by those electoral changes is part of the reason why we've seen such volatility mm -hmm. in markets over the course of the past few trading sessions and a reason to believe we'll continue to see that volatility in the future. 
Uh, Henk, looking at uh, going across to Britain before we get to Spain and, and the United States, uh, the coalition there under pressure and uh, the reaction to the Queen's speech saying not enough about the economy. Uh, David Cameron doesn't quite know how to steer this way. Now, they're not part of the Eurozone, but they're also under pressure electorally, which means that uh, Germany, looking for allies, can't count really on anyone now. I think that's right. Listen, in the UK, I think it's fair to say that the government have got a pretty tight balancing act to perform, but actually have been doing it very well indeed. We know they've introduced austerity measures. They've got to fight to rebalance the nation's finances. They've been able to maintain all in the all-important market confidence, hold on, at least in the short term, to that AAA credit rating. The price of that, of course, has been economic growth because not only have you got those austerity measures that have been introduced in the UK, consumption still remains very weak given the fact that inflation and fiscal tightening has been eating away at disposable income and that's against a backdrop of very high unemployment and weak pay growth coming through. Business confidence is very weak given the underlying conditions. Exports have been under pressure because of uh, the weak trading conditions that you find with our key trading partners, particularly in Europe. But we still believe the government is on the right path. We believe it's absolutely vital that they maintain that market confidence, rebalance the finances, and that is the foundation from which you can start to build from. So, in fact, we believe in the UK the government's ahead of the game, and some of these indebted countries in Europe, whether they be Spain, whether it be Italy, Portugal, We've seen it a little bit with Ireland or, or Greece, for example. They could do well to try and follow our route, although, of course, their path may be a little bit more bumpy given the size of their challenges. Hink, I mean, from a trading point of view, just listening to you, would you rather have the pound or the euro? <laughs> I would rather have the pound at the moment. There's no doubt about that. I think, you know... This debate around the all-important test, should the UK go into the euro, <laughs> they've all been answered very, very quickly during the course of this crisis. One of the fundamental problems that we've seen with the eurozone since inception is the idea that a single monetary policy, a single currency can work for such a diverse set of regions. I mentioned earlier, Henk, that uh, people are looking at the US and saying uh, we need more quantitative easing. Uh, and looking at what they're doing as opposed to Europe. W what is your assessment of where the US is? I think the US authorities have been very brave. I think they've been aggressive. They've been proactive. They weren't rewarded for that bravery during the course of 2011. There were big hopes. They failed to live up to their hopes. But I think as the year went on last year and as we've moved into this year, I think we can be increasingly confident that the US will be leading the economic recovery in the developed world. Some of the most recent data has certainly been positive, particularly revolving around the consumer. Consumer confidence absolutely battered in the first half of last year, slowly been recovering and getting better as this year has gone on. That's important in terms, of course, the robust retail sales that's generated from the consumer. Remember, the US consumer accounts for 70% of economic activity in the United States. In fact, 14% of global purchases come from the US consumer. So I think we can be positive there. I think if you look at the order books of both manufacturing and non-manufacturing, they look pretty good at the moment. The one area of concern that you can still point to is the US housing market. House prices in the United States still 30% lower than that 2006 peak, and that continues to be a, a major area of concern. But generally, I think the data's been improving, and the US still remains our favoured market. Hink, uh, looking at Europe, how much of an effect will it have on global growth? You know, if you looked at the US trade numbers today, they were down, exports falling. If we look at uh, the Chinese uh, trade numbers as well, exports falling, etc., um, is this the Europe effect? Is this the you know, Eurozone effect? And how do you think it will affect it, uh, continue to affect it in the years to come? It is the Eurozone effect, there's no doubt about that. Some pretty gloomy numbers in terms of expectations for the Eurozone's performance during the course of this year. We expect the Eurozone to contract to the tune of three-tenths of one percent. And actually, as you look out to 2013, I think we're only talking about anemic economic growth, maybe eight-tenths of one percent. Compare that to what we're seeing in the United States 
we're expecting growth of 2.4%. But as you say, even in some of these robust areas, the emerging markets, the likes of China, they're not immune from that. This is where many of these countries are selling their products. If the Europeans aren't buying, which I think is very clear indeed, compared to what you see in the United States, consumer confidence still remains very weak indeed. Unemployment is very high, around 10.9% and expected to rise. So it's, I think when you look at the economic regions, the United States, the consumers looking in good shape, will continue to buy, will continue to be supportive. China will increasingly be a story about consumption, but the big drag from a consumption perspective has got to be the Eurozone, and that will bring down global growth. Let's talk about gold, uh, Henk, uh, you, in the material that you sent us before, and you suggested we talk about falling gold prices. Mm -hmm. Perhaps that's putting it strongly, but there is a view mm -hmm. that, the, that gold is maybe poised for a fall, and some of the companies that are reporting at the moment uh, are missing of production targets, targets, but profits still look good because of the high gold price. So, uh, for example, over a well, nine-month period... We still remain... Carry on. We still remain pretty cautious about the prospects for gold. A lot of our clients come to us and they say, we believe we should be buying gold. I say, why do you, why do you want to buy gold? They tell me it's a hedge against inflation, taking advantage of a weaker US dollar, or they believe it's the ultimate safe haven. To me, not many of those arguments stack up. Inflation expectations still remain low. The dollar, if anything, is likely to strengthen over the course of the next few months. And we don't believe the world's going to look an awful lot worse tomorrow than it does today. In terms of factors that need to be put in place in order for the gold rally to be maintained, I think there's three things that you can point to. Number one, physical buyers continue to react to price dips. Now, there was some evidence they were doing that below 1,700. Most recent data suggest that hasn't been happening in the same fashion. Number two, exchange-traded fund positions need to be maintained, even though other asset classes increasingly look more attractive. But also, number three, I think the real interest rate, real negative interest rate environment needs to be maintained at a time, and also a spike up in terms of inflation expectations. In the short term, some of that is absolutely possible. Long term, I don't believe that's the case. In fact, our sister company, the investment banking side of Barclays, had a price target on gold of $1,400 an ounce by 2015. So in the medium to long term, I'd still be pretty cautious about its prospects. Last question from David. Very briefly, I mean, what's your asset allocation at the moment and uh, whereabouts? You know, equities, bonds, where the still equities, got a where healthy, the bonds? Still got a healthy weighting in terms of cash. We believe that's the best safe haven. We certainly believe it's better value than compared to bonds. We're underweight bonds. But we really believe that the investment side of your portfolio, the growth side of your portfolio, will be driven by exposure to equity markets, where the fundamentals still look absolutely fabulous and have been confirmed during the course of this first quarter reporting season. In the United States, 70% of companies beating or exceeding analyst expectations both in terms of revenue and in terms of profits in terms of meet or exceeds in europe 50 percent not as good but still a very very bright corporate fundamental picture